the biggest deal by far was the Vietnam War. Right. And uh, the protests had started and not started, continued. Uh, and a good friend had come back to visit us, Brooks Walker, from here and his wife. And we went down and sat in the National Museum and watched the protesters go by. And Brooks is a very conservative Republican. And he turned to me and he said, these aren't hoodlums out here. He said, there are a bunch of people out there that look like you and me. And he later told me, he said, it really changed his view about the war. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, it was building up and up and up. And uh, McCloskey was screaming in the Congress about it and going to Vietnam and going to Laos and, and uh, finding that the US ambassador in Laos gave him a forged document. Pete had the original, and the ambassador eliminated the critical paragraphs and handed it to Pete. And Pete said, that's interesting, Mr. Ambassador. You deleted and you know, and just embarrassed the ambassador and got in a huge fight. Roly Evans was a friend of the ambassador. Tried, And all of that stuff was going on. And my friend Chuck Daly, McCloskey's partner in, in uh, Korea, went with him to Vietnam because Pete was going to be flying out around on a helicopter seeing what was going on. And Chuck thought that his pal McCloskey was, would be killed by the US CIA or the military. Oh a congressman. God. He yeah. literally thought a US congressman was going to get killed. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he figured that if he went along, and I said, that was really smart, Chuck. You were going to get killed too. <laughs> <laughs> nice play. And we all went to, to JFK terminal when they got back to welcome them home because they were alive yeah. with their wives who thought they were going to get killed. Now, how early on was this? Do you remember? How what? How early on in these? This was this all two years. around in 1960, 1970. But the the big the culmination of it came when the president went on television April 30th of 1970 and announced the bombing of Cambodia. Mm -hmm. They called it an incursion. Yes. And that was this huge deal. Mm -hmm. uh, it happened to be my birthday. At that time, Tom Williamson, ex Rhodes Scholar, had come back. He actually ended up working with me uh, on a program to have college students evaluate federal programs around the country, a summer program, mm -hmm. uh, which caused a lot of agitation, too because we sent a lot of black students out to check on white guys in the South. <laughs> but anyway, Tom was living at our house, and, and his best black friend from Harvard, equally brilliant guy, was there with him. By the way, Tom had been arrested trying to get into our house when he forgot his house key. And we, you could actually get into our house by going in the backyard and going up on the roof and going up and through a window where his room was upstairs. And the neighbors called the police because there was a black guy on the roof of our house. And, and the police ran him in and found out that, in fact, he lived in the house. And, oh, he had to present. He found his passport in the house and, and showed him who he was. Mm -hmm. and not a, but that shows you what a, a black guy in Virginia in 1970 was a target for the police, as he yeah. was when he lived in, uh, I was with him one time when a cop pulled him over in Oakland and finally said to him, what are you doing downtown here? Are you causing trouble? And Tom says, no, I live in, in Piedmont, and I, I'll tell you all about it if you give me a ride home. So the cop gave him a ride home, and he says, oh, you're Tom Williamson. By this time, they knew he was a Rhodes Scholar. Mm -hmm. And said, why didn't you tell me? And Tom said, because I didn't want to be an exception. I wanted to prove to myself how you guys really treat black people. Anyway, oh, so Tom I, has been arrested, but he's yeah. there for dinner in our house with his friend. And that afternoon, Ed Morgan, who worked for John Ehrlichman, called me and said the president's gone on television at 9 o'clock, 6 o'clock Pacific Coast time, and we want you to watch. I said, Ed, what the hell is going on? And, I mean, he was a good friend. I mean, he and, and Lynn Garman and I had played tennis on the White House tennis court together. Mm -hmm. Now, who was this who called you? Ed Morgan, Ed Morgan. working for John Ehrlichman. He was okay. sort of, Ehrlichman assigned Morgan to me, said, when you can't 
I can't be dealing with you all the time. Deal with Ed. Anything you tell Ed is okay for me. Okay. Uh, even to the point, by the way, that Morgan had summoned me to the White House one time to work on a presidential message at 5 o'clock at night. And I got there, and he said, would you like to have a drink? I said, wait a minute. I'm exhausted, and we're going to work on a message. He says, have a drink. And I said, well, what about the message? And he says, here's the message. And he handed me an envelope. And in it was a ticket to the playoff game for the, the, the final playoff of the college basketball championships with UCLA and Kentucky or somebody mm -hmm. after Louisville, I forget. And I said, what's this all about? And he says, that's a present from Ehrlichman to you and me. You and I are going to the ball game. <laughs> So we went there, and we, Ehrlichman was sitting behind me, and Bob Finch was there, and we watched UCLA win the national championship. Oh, cool. So, I mean, I knew these people well. Mm -hmm. And he called, and he said, you got to watch. I said, what the hell is going on? And he said, watch the television. So I did. And, and it was, we had this little birthday party, and, and we turned on the TV just before 9 o'clock, and here comes the president. And he announces that we're bombing Cambodia. We've been invading a neutral country. We're doing all this stuff. And it was just terrible. And at 9.15, after the president talked, Ehrlichman, uh, Morgan called and said, did you watch that? And I said, yes. And he said, what did you think? And I said, Ed, I don't know what's going on, but I have the feeling you're under tremendous pressure so whatever works for you, tell them that's what I think. He said, I won't do that. I said, you got to do that, because I, I don't want to get you in trouble. It doesn't mean anything to me. Who cares what I think about this? He said, I've been instructed to ask you what you think. And I'm sitting there, and I'm looking at Tom Williamson, and he knows what's going on, and so does his friend. And I'm thinking, you know, do I cop out? I think I probably would have copped out. Uh, if they hadn't been there. But I remember exactly. You're going to think I'm very profane in this <laughs> whole thing. I said, Ed, it's the worst fucking thing I've ever heard. Wow. <laughs> and then I look at Williamson and I just... And then the phone rings and it's McCloskey. And McCloskey says, you know, I've got this deal with Ehrlichman. If we're ever really upset that he'll come pick us up and we'll fight it out on the way to the to town, mm -hmm. and he lived out beyond us in McLean. And we would see each other socially, too, and our wives and stuff. Mm -hmm. Not a lot, but enough. And Bill Rehnquist, too, he lived in the neighborhood. Yeah. So he says, Ehrlichman is picking me up at 6.30 in the morning, and then we're coming to your house, and we're picking you up, and then we're going to have a discussion about it. And McCloskey's more angry than I am. Uh, so that happens, mm -hmm. and McCloskey and Ehrlichman sit in the back seat of his limousine, and I sit in the front seat with the driver, and then ensues a screaming argument for 45 minutes, and McCloskey saying, you know, we ought to impeach the president, this, this is, you can't do this, uh, and Ehrlichman is basically saying, to hell with you, and by the time we get to the White House parking lot, McCloskey and I have to get a taxi to get to our offices by that time. Uh, Ehrlichman is saying to McCloskey, Pete, I don't want to ever see you again as long as I live. I'm never going to talk to you the hell with you. And I've been kind of a bystander. I would try to chip in, but the two of them were screaming at each other, so I wasn't really part of the argument. Finally, and this was during the nattering nabobs of I negativism. Mean, all, mm -hmm. And I said, at least you can tell the vice president to shut up. And Ehrlichman told, as I remember he was walking in the, from the parking lot, and the, well, as he turned around, he says, you tell him to shut up, we can't. 